Good morning and welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Public Works. Today is Monday, September 25th, 2017. Commissioner Rivas, Repenning, Davis and Jacinto are present. Vice President Repenning, we do have a quorum. May we start with Bureau introduction, starting with Bureau of Street Services. Tim Tyson, Bureau of Street Services. Brett McReynolds, Bureau of Contract Administration. Lance Vincent, Bureau of Sanitation. Patrick Schmidt, Bureau of Engineering. Good morning, Ted Jordan, Public Works General Counsel. Dr. Campos, Executive Officer. Vice President Repenning, we did not receive any speaker cards under uh, general public comment. We have no commentary under the Neighborhood Council comment section. We did receive speaker cards on items number two and seven for today's agenda. Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Campos. I will go ahead and close public comment. I will also close Neighborhood Council commentary. Is uh, there a second to my motion to approve the minutes from the meeting of Wednesday, August 20, 30th, 2017? Seconded by uh, Commissioners Davis and Rivas. Those minutes will be approved. A couple of housekeeping items, uh, agenda item number six. Um, <clears throat> we are going to continue as the, uh, um, the uh, owner uh, of the um, business in question is working with the Bureau of Sanitation to try to uh, address the matter that has led to this revocation hearing. Um, so I think we're meeting with him on Wednesday. And uh, so we will continue this. Um, why don't we say three weeks, Dr. Campos? Give us three weeks and then hopefully it won't, won't be needed. Three weeks from today would be Monday, August, October 16th. Okay, um, sounds good to me. And then uh, agenda item number 10, um, we're going to continue to a later date um, so that we have our full board present uh, for the presentation. Um, let's go ahead and uh, do agenda item number one. Um, it is a, uh, an item here at the board. Executive officer to formally report on bids received, opened, and declared September 20th, 2017 at 10 a.m. as authorized by the board for the following public works project. Number one, for the Argo drain sub-basin facility project. Estimate $23,435,933. That's in CD11. Number two, for the Hyperion Wastewater Reclamation Plant Injection Facility Replacement, estimate $1,864,000, also in CD11. Number three, for the Active Transportation Program, Safe Routes to School, Infrastructure Improvements for A. Dolores Huerta Elementary School, 28th Street Elementary School, and Quincy Jones Elementary School. B. ATP SRTS Infrastructure Improvements for Menlo Avenue Elementary School and West Vernon Avenue Elementary School, and C, Menlo Avenue Elementary School Pedestrian Improvements, estimate $9,999,681 in CD9. Madam Vice President and Commissioners, on Fernando Campos, Executive Officer, on September 18th, this board authorized myself or my assistant to receive and open and declare bids that were scheduled to be received on Wednesday, September 20th at 10 a.m. As you're aware, this board did not meet in that, um, that date due to the offsite meeting that we had in Council District 13. Um, I am pleased to report the results from the three bids that came in. It was extremely uh, competitive and dynamic and a lot of uh, a huge turnout that day. So I will succinctly and uh, quickly go through the bids that were opened um, so that your board can receive and declare those bids officially onto the record. The first project that was for the Argo Drain Subbasin Facility Project, uh, we received in total six bids. The first bid was from Flatiron West Incorporated for $37,021,500. The second bid is from Kiwit Infrastructure West Company, $37,577,500 even. The third is from Maladin Boontich Construction Company Incorporated for $42,992,500. The fourth from Myers & Son Construction LP for $33,740,500. The fifth from OHL USA Inc. 
for $35,810,500 even, and the sixth and final bid for the first project was from W.A. Rasick Construction Company Incorporated for $38,725,000 even. These bids results were um, prepared for you in hard copy and distributed for your record. I will also, for the record, uh, place a copy of these bids uh, and their dollar amount in the back of the room for those that are in attendance or those that are listening in as well. I'll give a copy also to our city attorneys um, as I speak now. Those were the bids for the first project, for the Argo uh, project. The second bid was for the Hyperion Wastewater Reclamation Plant. In total, we did receive six bids as well. The first bid was from Environmental Construction Incorporated for $1,876,032.17. The second bid was from Green Building Corporation for $2.2 million even. The third bid is from Meta Mechanical Company doing business as MMC Incorporated for $1,680,000 even. The fourth is from Metro Builders and Engineers Group Limited for $1,737,107 even. The fifth bid was from PPC Construction Incorporated for a total bid amount of $1,710,220. And the sixth and final bid for the second project was from Stanek, that's S-T-A-N-E. K, Constructors Incorporated for a total bid amount of $1,775,000,000 even. Again, that was for project number two, Hyperion Wastewater Reclamation Plant. The third and final bid received was for the active transportation program. In total, we did receive also six bids, again, highly competitive um, and well turned out. The first bid was from All American Asphalt for $11,494,037 even. The second bid was from Environmental Construction Incorporated for $11,741,968 even. The third bid from Griffith Company for $10,417,300.90. The fourth bid from Los Angeles Engineering Incorporated for a total bid amount of $9,767,146.80. The fifth bid is from Palp Inc. doing business as Excel Paving Company for a total bid amount of $10,362,204.30. And the sixth and final bid received for the third project is from Sully Miller Contracting Company for a total bid amount of $9,000,000. $521,055.85. Madam Vice President, these were the bids received for the third project. In total, we did receive 18 bids, uh, six bids for each of the projects. And now before you is uh, consideration to officially receive and declare these uh, bids forthwith. Thank you, Dr. Campos. It is great to see so much interest in um, our projects. Uh, is there a second to my motion to receive the bids today? Seconded by Commissioner Davis. Any objections? Any objections to sending it forthwith? Okay, those bids will be received and sent forthwith. Um, we will go now to uh, the Bureau of Sanitation for the presentation. Then I'm gonna call agenda item number two and agenda item number seven. I know there are speaker, uh, um, speakers here on uh, agenda items number two and seven. So we'll do that right after this. Um, first, I want to acknowledge a group in the back. Hi, Ms. Batar, how are you? Eva, can you come up to the mic for us, please? Thanks. Where are you from? Um, we are a group of, of students from Germany, oh. and uh, we are on a field trip because they are students of geography, and um, yeah, one, one part of their studies is to do a field trip, and we chose to go to California because it's really interesting. We have the physical part of geography, we have the um, human and social part of geography, and even the city planning, and that's why we're here today, just to learn a little bit about the city of Los Angeles. and how public works um, goes on here, yes. Great, well welcome, we are the Board of Public Works. We help oversee our city's Department of Public Works, um, which handles uh, many of our core services um, 
and also uh, the infrastructure, the public right of way, um, engineering, sanitation, street services, street lighting, contract administration. Um, so we're very happy to have you at our regular meeting here today. It's a meeting where anyone from the public can come and address our board. Um, it's a way of providing accountability and an opportunity for the people of Los Angeles to really engage with the city um, and this department, which is one of the, the most, um, one of the departments that has the most direct interface with, with people in LA. So thank you for coming. Thank you so much. We hope you have a great visit. That we can see it. It's really an impression for us. It's really, really nice. Thank you so much. Great, enjoy. Thanks, Eva. Karen Coca, come on down. Good morning. Vice President Repenning, um, Commissioner Davis, Commissioner Jacinto, Commissioner Rivas. My name is Karen Coca. I work with the Bureau of Sanitation. I'm the Citywide Recycling Division Manager. And I just love to be able to uh, recognize and encourage zero waste programs, especially when they're first starting. Um, and that's what today is about. And I am a geography major from um, Cal State Northridge, so it all works out. Uh, learn about urban studies early on. Um, anyway, that was a aside. Uh, so today we're here to recognize both um, members of our staff and also um, from LAWA uh, for really taking the lead uh, in starting food waste recovery programs um, at LAX. LAX is an LA San customer and also a partner. We've been working with them for many years and uh, reporting on all the great things that they do, but they want to go a step farther. So um, of course our staff leaped in uh, and they've been working cooperatively for several months to start out a food waste pilot at LAX. Um, so <clears throat> uh, it took some work to get the pilots ex established. We gave uh, special bins, we did training for uh, the concessionaire staff, worked with them, but the results have been pretty amazing with only four, uh, well it's three restaurants and the United uh, VIP lounge. Uh, we started collecting uh, over a ton and a half of food waste every week. Um, and if, if this program and the success of this program, if we can expand it to all of LEX, and especially the forward facing um, in the public, that will take them um, a long ways to getting to zero waste there at LEX. Um, we estimate you could probably get 12 to 15 tons a day just of food waste if, if we expanded it to all concessionaires at the LAX property. And so we're very excited to work closely with them, um, to do the training, to provide them the services. And they've done a great job uh, with their own staff uh, to cooperate and to be part of it, do all the, the heavy lifting literally to collect all the materials. And then we take them to an anaerobic digester that's out in um, Paris and they basically turn that into fuel and other products. And so it's a great closed loop system and that's what we're here to recognize today. So um, what I'd like to do is just, I'm gonna call up uh, all the awardees uh, at the same time and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Lawrence Hartnett who is an AGM at LAWA uh, to talk about the program. So. Um, Let's see, let's call up uh, Edward Malara, um, Ralph Suarez, and then we had one for the Lawa Recycling Crew. Are you folks gonna uh, collect theirs as well? Um, on our staff, uh, Rowena Romano, who leads on um, in our support services on, on the food waste contracts and also the food waste pilots that we're doing in the single family realm, um, another set of our customers. Uh, James Roska, who also works for Support Services Division. Uh, Maravik Sabio, who works for me. Uh, 
and she put together and did all the training. Um, Maravik's been working in the city facilities recycling program for many years and has uh, probably, you've seen many of, of her instructive and educational um, pieces that have gone out. Nadie Mackling, who um, is a force to be reckoned with and who uh, actually has, has been with us working on our programs for many years and she's good at just bringing everybody together and getting things done. Um, and then last but not least, Lawrence Hartnett from, the, from LAWA. And I'll turn it over to him if he wants to make some remarks. Good morning. Actually, I just wanted to uh, thank you very much for uh, recognizing this, uh, this program. Um, I would like to real quickly acknowledge a few of the key players here that helped with the implementation and development of the project from our um, LAX recycling group. We have Ed Malara and uh, Ralph Suarez who from day one have been uh, very much active in this. Uh, their conscientiousness and creativity have uh, uh, resulted in a very successful pilot program. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our friends and partners at Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, they've been amazing. They're in enthusiasm for the project and uh, their willingness to go the extra mile definitely added to the success of this project and again it's very much appreciated. Moving forward we hope that the lessons learned from this pilot program will result in being able to roll the program out over the entire uh, LAX facility. So again thank you very much. Thank you. And so I, I would like to um, present the certificates. Does anyone else want to make a, Nady, want to say something? <laughs> Hi, Nady. Hi, uh, Vice President Commissioner Raffening. Um, this was lo a long time coming to have a pilot project of food waste recycling at the second largest airport in the United States and being the second largest city in the, in the United States. So we're very excited to partner with the Department of Airports. And it is a major achievement because this is interdepartmental. It's not just within us and we had to get their buy-in, but we were very successful in getting Ed Melara with the leadership of Larry and of course, Ralph Suarez to get this started and off the ground. So we are excited to have them here. Thank you. So again, I'd just like to say thank you um, both to the, the LA San employees who really live their jobs and, and love recycling and then the folks at LAWA who also love recycling and have invested their time and efforts and we want to encourage them and all other city departments um, to move in the same way. We're looking forward to working here in the Civic Center as well. Um, we're going to do some waste sampling soon uh, where we're going to see just what everybody in the Civic Center area, uh, the City Hall complex area throws away. We're going to work on some programs and maybe get some food recovery here as well. And so. It's, it's an exciting time and we're really looking forward to the future um, here in Los Angeles. So, Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Karen, uh, your, your commitment to recycling and to zero waste is, um, I've gotten a chance to experience it firsthand, but we are truly lucky um, at the City of LA to have you working uh, with us, leading us uh, down the road to zero waste. Um, and thank you for bringing this project in here today so that we can give it the support and recognition that it deserves. Um, I, first of all, I wanna thank the folks at LAWA for opening their doors um, and recognizing that you know it's really through um, these partnerships that we're gonna make uh, the, the difference that we wanna make in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the, the environment. Um, and I want to thank uh, the team at Sanitation, um, James, Nady, Rowena, you guys are awesome. Um, can I also just thank you for your help this weekend at 
the hackathon we did on recycling at um, Hyperion. Uh, really great to see you there as well. Um, it's a new moment for recycling in the city of LA and we're taking some major steps forward in a bunch of different areas and um, as you know the the need to address food waste um, is is something that you know we all take very seriously and this is a great pilot um, an opportunity to see how how this can work um, and how it can be scaled up across the city um, I'm not going to make a joke about a peanut rich you know compost product which I'm sure would be very you know very nutrient rich um, peanuts <laughs> Air, airport it's fine it's Monday morning I'm doing my best um, you know when they talk about uh, climate change and they talk about the Paris Agreement and they you know and there was a question about whether we we as a country would would stay in the Paris agreement and you know we said no matter what California we're going to continue pushing ahead that's what this work looks like um, as we know landfill landfills are the number one emitter of greenhouse gases in the state of California so th we're addressing that here with these projects so I appreciate all of you um, I will turn it over to Commissioner Davis yes I just wanted to uh, Commissioner uh, repenting to commend you and your liaison work but particularly Karen uh, in the work that she has done I think this again is an example of collaboration we've always said in government with less funds that what we have to do to make things happen is to collaborate so Lawa I hope that this pilot project will be in fact an example for other airports across the country in terms of what we can do for food recovery and Karen I'm very impressed and I continue to learn as we move forward to achieve food recovery not only at the airport but at other areas and or other organizations within the city of Los Angeles I like the fact that you're moving to the Civic Center and I would suspect once we do that we're going to keep moving uh, to other groups and or organizations within the city of Los Angeles and I think ultimately demonstrating how we can effectively manage food recovery throughout this entire city so today I commend you and Lawa for being first uh, to not only uh, impress upon airports but being first in impressing upon those of us in the city of Los Angeles of what we can do uh, when we collaborate so congratulations Commissioner Sinto. Thank you, Vice President Repenny. Thank you for your leadership. Karen, you and your team are great. Um, Rowena, James, Nady, and Mari Vick over there, Mr. Hardnett, for you three. It, it shows this uh, collaboration interdependency between departments is really what we're benchmarking. We're encouraging that. And as the pilot project, hopefully we continue. When, when you say you're doing 1.5 tons uh, a week and it could be 12 to 15 tons daily is incredible that's a lot of power if we turn that into something that we're going to do hopefully we could do that within the city um, system uh, at Hyperion or DGUP or something but th just the fact that we're we're doing that and that zero waste turns into power is really important so thank you for setting the um, that interdependency um, and benchmarking and encouraging others to to do the right thing and to get on the program thank you Commissioner Rivas. Uh, no, thank you for getting this started. I'm very impressed, like my colleagues, um, this program, and I look forward um, to it coming to the Civic Center and beyond, you know, and getting the word out through education on how important um, recycling food um, is to our city. So thank you for all of your work, and I look forward to what's next for you. Thanks, everyone. I think we'll take a, a brief uh, recess to take a photo. Uh, oh, distribution of the certificates. One minor detail. The official part. Okay, so um, in no particular order, um, I want to present this certificate of recognition to Rowena Romano. <laughs> to what, uh, Ralph Suarez. Very much. To Edward Millara. Oh, you. You. To James Roska. Not to you. That's 
Let's see, I guess you want to have this one for your maintenance crew. That's a pretty one. You can hang that one on the wall. Nady Mackley. Thank you, Nady. Really, with my staff, I just have to let them loose. It, it, it's not a matter of them needing direction. They just find find the next thing to do and they go do it. There's there's not much prodding. Um, Florence. Last but not least, Maverick. Thank you. Quiet one in the back. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you again uh, for your excellent work. Um, we would love to take a photo with you right over here. Um, and then we will come back. We'll take agenda item number two, then agenda item number seven. Thank you. Agenda item number two is an assessment hearing in Council District 11, um, resolution of acceptance, 1911 Act Mar Vista near Venice Boulevard improvement project, recommending the board number one, approve full acceptance and adoption of warrant and assessment for the Mar Vista improvement number A11-E1907442 under the Improvement Act of 1911 and two, Authorize the board president or two commission, commissioners to execute the warrant subject to city council confirmation of said assessment and hearing consideration. Um, this is continued from Friday, August 25th, 2017. Um, we have uh, Mr. Randy Price here to present agenda item number two. Good morning, my name is Randy Price. I'm with the Bureau of Engineering. This project, the um, Mar Vista near Venice Boulevard um, improvement project was um, an assessment project that was uh, a community driven project that the community petitioned to the city uh, many years back, I think this project uh, first, um, um, we first spoke to members in the community about around 2008. Um, we received a petition from the community members in the um, um, Mar Vista North Oval, which is near Venice, between Venice and the Washington Boulevard. Uh, it ha it's the streets of Marcusell, uh, East Park, and North Park. The petition was submitted to the Bureau of Engineering uh, in two, uh, 2011 and um, sent forward to, after validating the petition, the Bureau of Engineering mailed out ballots to uh, all the property owners within the district, and we received a 70% um, yes response for uh, continuing with this project at that time. 
So the petition was forwarded to the city council in uh, 2011. The city council adopted that petition and um, asked the Bureau of Engineering to proceed with the work. So the Bureau of Engineering designed a, um, a, the, this project, which was consisted of a, a um, full street improvement project in which the streets were to be reconstructed and new curb and gutters put in, uh, cross gutters uh, put in, um, ADA compliant uh, crosswalks were put in for the area. And so as a part of this project and developing it with the community, the community agreed to the formation of an assessment district to pay for the curb and gutter portion of the project. And the city agreed to pay for the reconstruction of the street. Um, the city also agreed to pay for certain portions of the um, curb and gutter, particularly some of the drainage uh, concerns, which were considered to be of a general benefit to the city at large to improve some of the drainage in that area. So the, the portion of, a portion of this project then was agreed to be funded by uh, an assessment against the property owners. The um, project was designed and completed design in 2013 and then sent back to the city council with an ordinance of intention and a public hearing was held at that time. Uh, at, at that public hearing, the council adopted the ordinance of intention and then ordered the city to mail out ballots to all of the property owners. So the property owners had another option, another chance to vote on this particular project. At that time, a majority of the property owners voted in favor of the assessment district. And so the assessment district was uh, officially formed. The project was put out to bid with public bids. Um, advertised by the Board of Public Works. We received two bidders on this project, um, one from uh, Toro Incorporated and one from PALP Incorporated. Both bids were uh, higher than the city engineer's estimate. And so after uh, rather lengthy deliberation, it was decided that the city would come forth with some additional money and awarded that project to Toro Incorporated. And so then Toro was given a notice to proceed and began the construction of that project. Since the property owners had voted on an amount of money that was um, given as part of the city engineer's estimate, then the property owners were not asked to pay for any additional costs that were incurred for that project. Um, the project was constructed. Uh, the construction, um, Toro Incorporated started construction in uh, May of 2015. Uh, construction was completed in January of 2016, and um, so now we are uh, at that part of the project where we are going forward to confirm the assessments. Upon um, adoption of the resolution of acceptance by the board today, this project will um, then be forwarded to the city council where they will hold another public hearing and then confirm the assessments. If the assessment amount is, once the assessment amount is confirmed, then the Bureau of Engineering will uh, mail out a bill to all the property owners and give them the opportunity to come forward and pay uh, in cash. They can pay the full amount or any part of it in cash for a 30-day period. If they choose to not do that, then the whatever amount is remaining will roll over into a uh, bond, uh, 1911 Act bond in which the property owners then will have a 10-year period in which they can pay off that bond. They will be billed twice a year through that 10-year period, uh, generally the same time as the property tax. They're billed by the Office of Finance, uh, the uh, street Im improvement bond section within the Office of Finance, and, and make that payment then. Um, both This project was a partnership both with the Bureau of Engineering for the curb and gutter portion and with the Bureau of Street Services for the street improvements that were done. Uh, the street was uh, reconstructed with um, the, uh, I think, a DWP water line relocated and the crown was lowered for the street. This was a uh, substandard street or non-conforming street within the city that had been built uh, many, many, many decades ago in which the street itself 
did not have uh, gutters at the time that it was built, and only portions of the uh, curbs were remaining on, on parts of the street. So um, that is pretty much all that I have, I think. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Price. I think what we'll go ahead and, and do now is um, uh, let's call our speakers, and then okay. we may come back to you with questions. Um, I'd like to hear, first of all, from Kathleen Cahill. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so in listening to um, what the speaker just said, I just have a couple of notes that I wanted to address. Number one, I am a property owner on the corner of Pacific Avenue and East Boulevard. All of my neighbors on Pacific Avenue, and my dress is Pacific Avenue, have not been invoiced for this project because they're not part of the North Oval. My home is on Pacific Avenue, but I am invoiced for this project. My husband voted no. For some reason, I didn't get a vote, although I'm joint property owner with my husband, and my vote would also have been no. So I have a couple of issues, and I didn't know if this was the right place to address them, but considering that this is a North Oval project and my home is on Pacific Avenue, I'm not sure what to do with my $9,000 invoice. Also, when we bought our home in 2008, the streets were a complete wreck potholes everywhere. We had so many flat tires we had to deal with. So I'm a little bit confused as to why the residents of this area would have to pay for the street to be repaved when I have friends and family in other areas of Mar Vista where their streets were repaved and they were not billed $10,000. So I do have a lot of concerns with that, and I don't w feel that we should have to pay for this for the reasons that I just stated. And separately, but also in the same realm of this, right now the city is building a second gigantic cell phone tower across the street from my house. So whatever amount of money the city is getting paid from Verizon to build that cell phone tower, second one across from my house, I'm sure that can pay for the streets. That's a whole other issue that we're dealing with that we're very upset about, so I just want to address my concerns here today. Thank you, Ms. Cahill. Um, uh, we'll go ahead and take the next uh, speaker, Mr. Christopher McKinnon. Thank you. Uh, I'm Christopher McKinnon. Stan Hoffman's not here. This is a thank you and appreciation. Uh, I'll try to speed read this, but I think you have a copy in front of you. Uh, the Mar Vista North Oval Capital Improvements Project resulted in the property owners approving an assessment on their properties for the reconstruction of the deteriorated 100-year-old curbs while the City of Los Angeles Department of Public Works provided the funds for the much-needed road improvements for a complete rebuild of our highly deteriorated roads. Simultaneously, the DWP replaced our old main water lines and the lateral connections to each property. Uh, we believe this to be one of the few successful property owner initiated assessment districts for street improvements other than street lighting in the last 20 years in Los Angeles and I believe maybe even 100 years. We extend our heartfelt thank you and appreciation to the following elected officials and city staff of the city of Los Angeles for planning and completion of the Mar Vista North Oval Curb Gutter Road and Water Capital Improvement Project. The late honorable city council member Bill Rosendahl of the 11th District, the current Honorable City Council Member Mike Bonin of the 11th District, the late Director of Street Services Bill Robertson, Kevin James, President of the Board of Public Works, uh, City Engineer Gary Lee Moore, Department of Public Works, Nazario Soseda, Director of the Bureau of Street Services, Len Nguyen, Senior Field Deputy to Mike Bonin, 11th District, and to the invaluable members of the LA Department of Public Works, Carl De La Fuentes, Project Manager, Street and Stormwater Division, Bureau of Engineering. Randy Price, Division Manager, Land Development and GIS Division, Bureau of Engineering, who I believe was brought back from retirement in order to finish this project with us. Uh, Ron Olive, Assistant Director of the Bureau of Street Services, retired. Keith Mosey, Assistant Director of the Bureau of Street Services. Sherman Torres, Chief of Operations, Resurfacing Division, Bureau of Street Services. Mark Patterson, LADWP Water Distribution, Associate Engineer and Steve Chen, Division Manager, Street and Stormwater Division, Bureau of Engineering. And finally, to our neighbors who started the original petitions in 2002, Connie Kay, and in 2004, Angel Vallejo, 
and all the community that supported this worthy project. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Um, we will go ahead and go to the next speaker, uh, Ms. Jennifer Dill. My name is Jennifer Dill. I've been a resident on uh, East Boulevard and Mar Vista since 1993. Uh, when I got the letter uh, about the, the street improvement, I actually sent a petition because number one, I was taking care of my mother. I'm a single parent. I only get one paycheck. I don't get any other assistance. And I told them I cannot afford it and I do not want it. You know, if I have to pay for it, I can't afford it. Basically, that's just what it was. So when they took my vote, I said, no, I do not want to be a part of it. I'm on the end by the alley. And then I get a letter saying that I would be assessed for this. And I'm wondering, how can I be assessed? I'm paying for student loans for my child that I don't get any money from. I'm paying for uh, a handicapped child that I have to take care of, that I'm working two jobs for. I'm near retirement. I can't retire. I'm 67 years old. Why do I have to pay for this? I'm paying for everything else. I don't get any money from the state or anybody to take care of all of this. I don't feel that I should have to pay for this because I'm taking care and I'm doing what I have to do as a property owner. I'm taking care of the property that I live in. Thank you very much. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you, Ms. Dill. Um, Mr. Price, can you come back up, please? Um, just a couple questions. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit um, to kind of get more on record about the mechanics of the assessment and and the vote. Um, so, you know, you kind of went through the history. Um, there was a desire by the community to, to have the extra work done and it was put to a vote as, as per our city's guidance on um, assessments when we when communities you know choose to uh, to pay for additional infrastructure presumably with the thought that it's going to improve um, uh, their neighborhood improve property value etc yes commissioner you know the um, the Bureau of Engineering is responsible for uh, processing these 1911 Act assessments unless they're streetlights. But essentially, these are community projects. The Bureau of Engineering's position is always a neutral position. Whether the project goes forward or not is, um, uh, we never weigh in one way or the other. Our whole responsibility is to just work through that process as long as it goes. And if the property owners vote against it then, and the, the thing fails, then, uh, you know, we're happy with that as well as if it goes forward. This project was petitioned by the community. The community, uh, you know, worked very hard. As Chris managed, uh, uh, mentioned, you know, they started this thing in 2002. It takes a lot of effort to get uh, these things off the ground. It takes a lot of effort, continuous effort, to keep it moving. Um, as uh, you know, the major petitioners in this project can tell you. This project was envisioned at, to uh, benefit that community with new streets, new curb and gutter, uh, new driveway entrances where needed, uh, and you know, uh, improvements to the sidewalks and improvements to the drainage uh, for that community. The property owners were not um, are being assessed, but they're not being assessed for the street uh, reconstruction. The street reconstruction is being paid for by the city. The Bureau of Street Services uh, took on that uh, um, role, that responsibility, and uh, are bearing the, the cost for that uh, reconstruction. They put it in their budget. Um, both former uh, Director Bill Robertson, uh, former Assistant Director Ron Olive, uh, and then the current director, Nazario Sasuda and uh, Keith Mose, were involved in this project throughout the, throughout the life of the project. And so they committed to doing the reconstruction. It was not a resurfacing. They had to regrade 
uh, the project, the street itself. The portion of it that the property owners were asked to pay for was the uh, curb and gutter. The curb and gutter, the curb line, typically those are considered to be, um, you know, benefit the property owners, benefit the value of the, of the property itself. And so they were assessed that cost. Uh, the, the drain, so typically if the, um, if a property owner had a 50 foot frontage, then they paid for the, essentially the cost for, uh, you know, the curb and gutter within 50 in their front, uh, you know, their front yard. And so, uh, you know, with the, uh, with corner properties, such as the property on uh, Pacific and East, typically the property owner pays for that portion of the uh, improvement that's on East that is, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, the front of their house or the side of the house, they pay for a portion of it. So there were, uh, you know, at least three properties which were in that uh, situation where they were um, a corner lot on Pacific and either Pacific and Marcusell or Pacific and East. Um, so they ended up being assessed a portion of that. Okay, so I just want to clarify a couple of things. Um, one is that the assessment, uh, what, what is the, the percentage of the, the, the affirmative vote needed to pass an assessment district? It's uh, uh, just a majority, a simple majority. So the, the assessment voting is governed by the state constitution. And so the state constitution has certain requirements for the formation of assessment district. Those are that you know, plans be available for the uh, community to re review a city, an engineer's report and an official ballot sent out by the city to, so that each property owner can vote on that. So in each, um, let me clarify that, for each property votes on it, but not if there are multiple owners, only one vote is, is counted per property. The, the, uh, the votes themselves are counted based upon the value of the estimated assessment. So it's really one dollar, one vote, as opposed to one property, one vote. So if your assessment amount is $10,000, your vote counts 10,000. If your assessment amount is $1,000, your vote counts 1,000. So the person that has to pay the most gets the largest say in the vote. Okay, thank you for that um, clarification. Uh, we do these assessment districts for Street lighting is obviously the most common. I've seen it as well for, um, I think, a street ma maintenance. Any, any type of public improvement uh, is, can be done through these assessments. So sewers, storm drains, uh, alleys, streets, curb and gutters, sidewalks, all those types of things can be done through uh, an assessment program. And typically within the uh, city of Los Angeles, uh, public improvements um, are paid for by general taxation only if they're considered a general benefit to the community. And so if the benefit, if the improvement is only a local benefit, then the local property owners are expected to pay for it. Okay. Um, and I also wanted to clarify, um, you mentioned that the city is paying for the street reconstruction. I just wanted to, you know, one of our speakers mentioned the feeling that, you know, I, I want to make sure that just because people are electing to um, pay for certain uh, elements themselves that specifically relate to their properties does not mean that the city is pulling out of this neighborhood and not funding the same types of services that we would fund elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I am, uh, before I go to my colleagues for questions, I am going to ask you before you leave today to uh, confer with Ms. Cahill on her questions about her invoice. Um, Commissioner Davis? Yes, um, certainly we all support improvements and I'm sure neighbors in our community support improvements as well. But as we listen to this whole issue, there are a lot of things that I would like to have a better understanding about. And the first of those is, is that you have explained that those property owners with the biggest financial share have the biggest vote. Who is the person that has the biggest share in this particular project? Within the area, there are, um, you know, 
various different properties. So typically there's, a, there's an apartment complex. There are two apartment complexes within the area. There is a, um, I think a convalescent home or some type of fac medical facility that's in the area. Uh, and um, there is another uh, home, I think that's uh, some type of nursing home of that type that's in the area. So those types of facilities pay the larger share. Uh, typically, we, we calculate rates based upon whether it's a single family residential property, they pay the lowest rate. The highest rate is paid by commercial properties. So there, to uh, my memory, there was one commercial property. There were several um, uh, res uh, multi-use residential properties that paid the higher rates. So, so it would be fair to say that the nursing home and the convalescent home and the uh, landlords who own the apartment buildings clearly wanted to make sure that this happened and had the positive vote on this particular item. I, I, don't, I do not know how each one voted. We are, the voting goes to the uh, elections division of the city clerk's office, and we never see how individuals actually vote. So we, do, we don't really know. But they did obviously give us a confirmation that the majority of the people in this jurisdiction did want it. Exactly. The, the city council uh, hold, holds a public hearing in which they open the vote, and, and the city clerk certifies that uh, a majority of the people within the district voted in favor of this project. So. Well, I'd have to say, based upon what I'm able to tell and my deductive logic and what you've already explained to me, yeah. given the fact that we have constituents here today, it would lead me to believe that these people with the lion's share of the vote yeah. and the economic interests wanted this to happen because it appears that some of the neighbors here did not necessarily want to sign on given the financial responsibility that would have been inherited by them on the project. Yes, that is correct. Is when we originally uh, uh, sent out what we call a straw ballot to the um, property owners uh, prior to the petition being granted, uh, we had about a 70% of the uh, residents voting in favor of the project. As we got through the design and got the city engineer's estimate, and they mailed out the official balance, that percentage dropped, it did, because the price of the project became clearer to us, it became higher, and more people um, no longer wished to participate. You know, unfortunately with the district and with public improvements, it's, a, it's an all or nothing, really, it's a democratic process, and so once, um, once the property owners voted in favor of it, then we had no choice but to move forward uh, with the project. So. Yeah, I, I don't think we did anything different in terms of what we needed to do when given the results from the office that holds the election. However, it really does draw an issue, as you mentioned, of uh, the s process being fair as it relates to now these individual homeowners claiming that it's a financial hardship yes. and that if in fact there was a democratic process, they would have elected not to do it because they can't afford the financial hardship. And yet when we talk about a fair democratic process, how fair is it when the decision goes to the person who has the most money? Yeah. Uh, so that's the question here. Uh, certainly perhaps it's not, nothing for Bureau of Engineering uh, in terms of the process, but it certainly does raise an issue of which we cannot turn a blind eye moving forward to constituents who, while they and all of us benefit from improvements on one hand, and yet we don't want to jeopardize our property and the home of our families and to get involved in a bill of $10,000 or more that we cannot afford and we know we can't afford it. We'd love to have a, a mansion but we can't afford it. We wouldn't go into a mansion knowing we can't make the monthly payments. So to what degree does fairness mean fair in a situation where constituents now have this $10,000 bill and the convalescent home and the nursing home, and I don't want to talk about how much they make a month, can afford to do it. So, I mean, unfortunately, this is the real issue here. Uh, for us, and I know we can't change it here, and I'm certainly not blaming you, yeah. but I'm just trying to discuss the issue in a real way 
that reflects the concerns of constituents in this particular case. I think you've done everything you're supposed to do, uh, but I, it does worry me that um, if constituents find themselves in this circumstance and they have no option out, is there any other option in the law? The city has what's called a deferral program. So for property owners that um, qualify, they can get an assessment deferral and then the city will pay that assessment. It is only a deferral. It's not, uh, um, does not but forgive the make, defense. As we do in other transactions, in certain circumstances, we will make appropriate arrangements where it would, we would make it the payback affordable. Right. And would we be willing to do this in this circumstance? I can't say without seeing um, all the, uh, we're, there's, there's certain things that have to be submitted for the application and the application then is reviewed. Uh, and if they meet those qualifications, then they could do it. I would be seriously concerned as a commissioner, I think, to discuss this as a routine matter and to ramrod it through is unfair looking at it objectively. I would seriously like to consider that this be a part of this effort because we do have these people that have appeared to us, and I do hear them, and I understand the law. The law is against them because it's for the person with the nursing home, and the convalescent home, to put it very bluntly. And so having said that, uh, it would be important to me that we do everything that we can for these citizens of Los Angeles to make sure that we can level the playing field. And of course, we have some work to do in terms of a board to talk about this policy, maybe to the council members, moving forward so that when we say a fair democratic process, um, it can really be a fair democratic process. And I do respect what we currently have but I, I realize the shortfall here. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Commissioner Jacinto. Thank you, Vice President Repenning. Um, you know, Commissioner Davis makes um, excellent, salient points. Uh, Randy, you mentioned deferral. What is the process by, process by which a, a homeowner, a property owner can avail of that deferral? Is there an application process? Yes, it is an application process. So an application is sent to the property owner, and the property owner is asked to provide certain information. Typically, they have to provide uh, tax returns for two years, credit reports, uh, that type of information so we can determine whether or not they qualify. They have to meet certain income guidelines uh, that are, were established by uh, city council. So if they meet those uh, guidelines for both income and assets, excluding their home and uh, car, that type of thing, then they can get, uh, then their uh, assessment can be deferred. So once it's deferred, once it gets to that point, then it comes back to the Board of Public Works. The Board of Public Works votes on whether the deferral will be uh, uh, approved or not. If it is, then funds are taken from uh, a source that's dedicated for this and use those funds to pay for the assessment on behalf of that property owner. The funds then are given to the contractor who uh, is you know waiting for payment obviously but the then the um, the property owner is required to repay that assessment once they transfer title or sell the home and then they uh, can will repay the assessment at that time the city takes a, puts a lien on the property and keeps a lien on the property until it's repaid so understood Randy is the period for the application for the deferral process is that close once we adopt this or what where are we at in that no the the deferral can uh, can be uh, applied for really at any time uh, there are um, you know advantages obviously to doing it as early as possible because uh, there are uh, uh, legal things that occur at specific times over the next few months the um, once the city council confirms the assessment then um, there's a 30-day payment period, which if they don't pay, it automatically goes to a bond. But then that bond has to be paid off, and that bond accrues interest. Typically, what we will do is select a payoff date when we know that it's near so that we pay off that interest portion, too, and give that to whoever the bondholder is. So, so hearing that we have that um, deferral process application open, still available to, to property owners, who need to avail of it for whatever reason, uh, I'm, 
I'm satisfied with the where we're at right now. I'm um, sorry, oh, we're going to go to Commissioner Rivas. Uh, some of my questions have already been asked, but um, how d how do the residents find out about this deferral program? The deferral program is it's usually mailed out with the bill, with the first bill that we, the Bureau of Engineering, mails out only one bill really. And so as soon as the assessments are confirmed, you know, then we know uh, precisely what each person is going to be assessed because it's been uh, adopted by council. So then the next day we mail out bills and within those bills we mail out usually deferral information and that type of stuff with the bill. Um, but besides the deferral, you said there's also an option to pay over 10 years where they're assessed twice a year? Is that, that is correct. So the standard, you, typically, uh, you know, property owners have, you know, obviously various uh, ways on their own that they can figure out how to pay for these unexpected bills. But uh, if they choose to go the bond route, which will they will do by default if they don't pay off the, uh, the assessment amount, then they will have 10 years to pay it off. Um, and so over interest, with interest, that is correct. So over 10 years, typically, if your assessment amount is just for an example, $10,000, that that's the principal assessment amount, then each year you're going to pay $1,000 a year plus whatever interest is owed on that 10,000, you know? And so that's each year you'll, you'll pay 1,000 in principal and then whatever amount of interest is owed. And that would be twice a year, right? And you pay twice a year, right? Your bill twice a year and uh, they, they divided up the Office of Finance divides, has a uh, application that divides it up for the payment that's due uh, in December, and then there's another payment that's due in June. Um, so when the residents voted, did they know, did they know the exact um, assessment amount? Yes, they knew their exact assessment amount. So that was part of their vote, right? Right. Once... They, once they vote, they vote on a particular amount of money, and so then we cannot assess them more than that ever. If the project, which we were very hopeful would, if it had come in at a lower cost, we could reduce their assessment, but we can never raise their assessment. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Rivas. Um, uh, Mr. Price, I wanted to just ask a couple questions. Uh, you know, our, our assessment process, um, we the, the vote is is made by the property owner, right? Not the tenant or someone else at the property, by the person who owns the property. That is correct. It's always the property owner. So the person voting is the person, and the person paying is the person who is actually also receiving the direct benefit of the improvements made. That is correct. Okay, so I, I just want to make sure, you know, I, I understand there's questions about the, the assessment um, district process, and I definitely hear them, and I definitely... Uh, understand um, uh, and, 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 and empathize with um, uh, people who may not have voted for the assessment, who, who may not feel that they're in a position to afford to pay for it. Um, I, I hear that. I also, however, want to say that this is a tool um, that we have in the city for communities to decide to, that if they want work done, and they don't want the city to be able to afford it in their general fund, and they realize that it's probably not going to happen from a general fund allocation, um, that, they, that they decide to pay for it themselves. And I think that that's a tool that is important to us because we want to be able to serve those communities. And if people are willing to say, we really want this infrastructure, we really want these services, we realize that it's above and beyond what the city would um, be doing in other communities, be able to do in our community, um, we will uh, pay, or in this case, chip in, since the city ended up funding the differential between the estimate and the actual cost of the work out of our general fund or some other fund. Yes. Um, uh, in this case, it's really about chipping in. Um, I, I do want to say that I, I support, you know, that this remains a tool in our arsenal. Commissioner Davis? I just wanted to say this is kind of a little different, and we support it, except that I want to ensure that there is information given to each family 
because the system is like almost the presidential election. Hillary might have gotten the most popular votes, but Trump got the electoral votes. And yet, in analysis, it's even a little different because even in the electoral vote, it's one vote per state. Here, it is disproportionate. It goes to the person with the most money. Now, it's terrible to have to talk about this, but how can we analyze this without integrity? It goes to the nursing home and the convalescent home. They determine whether I'm going to have a curve or not. I may have voted differently, and it could be a thousand of us, but if we own homes and they own facilities, their vote counts more than ours, right? That's the reality of it. So what I'm saying is I could support this if we ensure that each family, and as painful this is, this is to us on this side of the table, I feel it's equally painful to the families who have come here today. It's equally as painful to them that we have to discuss the reality of this policy. Uh, certainly we support improvements, and certainly they benefit from improvements. But as the system currently is, I want to ensure when we vote for this that we will do everything, Randy, we can to give them this information, that they can apply for this, and that they have a great opportunity to not be placed out of their home because two big boys decided that they wanted improvements around their facilities. And I support the improvement of their facilities, but I just have a problem with the lack of opportunities that people who might be the majority won't get in a system like what we have. But most of all, I have a concern that I could get priced out of my home as a parent and me and my children could be out on the street because somebody down the street wanted an improvement, which they are entitled to, but where's my entitlement? So without beating a dead horse, I want to ensure that every family that came here has that uh, information, and again, you said it comes back to us. Well, that might be justice. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Davis. Um, I would also just want to point out that, I mean, the way the system is set up, you know, on the, the other side of that coin is that what we're really doing is the people who have the most at stake, the people who are going to pay the most money if the assessment passes are the ones who have additional votes. And that's the way, you know, we conduct parcel taxes in the county. That's the way that, you know, in a lot of cases where, you know, there's a community-wide discussion of an assessment, you know, the people who are going to end up paying the most if it passes do have additional votes. And I, I think that that's not necessarily an unfair thing. Um, uh, so I, I, am, I think we've had a good, healthy discussion here today. I do appreciate all those speakers that came down to speak um, on this item. And I do appreciate uh, the letter that was submitted by Mr. Hoffman and Mr. McKinnon thanking the city for the work. Um, I know that these projects don't happen easily. I want to thank um, everyone at Engineering uh, and uh, uh, Street Services who has um, put work into this over the years. Thank you, Mr. Price. With that, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to um, receive the protests, receive and uh, consider the protests, recommending and, and recommend that the council confirm the proposed assessments Seconded by Commissioner Jacinto. Commissioner add, Davis, yes. I want to add to that that we ensure that the information that is available to those families in the minority is expended to them. Um, Dr. Campos, is that an amendment that we can? Uh, no need to amend. Right now we would just consider the, the protests that were discussed in oral testimony as considered and then move this forward, um, hopefully forthwith, to City Council. And then Mr. Price can work with the Office of Finance, uh, along with our office, if you will, uh, Mr. Price, to make sure that we do uh, include that information into the bills um, in compliance with the request from Commissioner Davis. Thank you. Um, so we, uh, is, are there any objections to receiving and considering uh, the protests? and recommending council confirm the proposed assessments. Madam Vice President, I, I do need a second for that. I do have a motion C on the table. Commissioner Jacinto Commis seconded. Second by yes. Commissioner Davis, thank you. Jacinto. So, thank you. Um, hearing no objections, uh, we will go ahead and receive and consider protests and recommending council confirmation of these assessments. Any objections to sending it forthwith? Hearing none, we'll send that forthwith. Um, thank you to everyone on agenda item number two. Let's go to agenda item number seven. Uh, 
I appreciate as well um, the speakers who are here on agenda item number seven today and thank you for your patience. Uh, this is an item with the Bureau of Street Services. It is a tree removal in CD 11 at 694 North Walther Way recommending that the board number one find that this project is categorically exempt under article three section one class three category one of the city's environmental quality act guidelines and there is no substantial evidence the proposed project will have significant effect on the environment and is in compliance with the in, with the california environmental quality act number two find that none of the exceptions to the use of categorical exemption as set forth in section 15300.2 of state CEQA guidelines apply. Number three, specify that the Bureau of Street Services Urban Forestry Division located at 1149 South Broadway is custodian of the documents of other material that constitute the record of proceedings upon which the board's decision is based. And number four, review and approve the request for a fee permit to remove three California sycamore trees. Tree replacements are required. <clears throat> Uh, on number seven, Tim Tyson from the Bureau of Street Services. Good morning, Vice President Repenting, Commissioners, Executive Officer, City Attorney, and Bureau Representatives. Mr. Mike Zapardi, Zapardi, property owner, is proposing to construct a new single family residence on a property measuring approximately 18,043 square feet located at 694 North Walther Way. The property owner is proposing to demolish the existing home with a footprint of approximately 3,699 3 square feet. The new footprint of the proposed residence will measure approximately 5,040 square feet. Mr. Angelo Garcia, property owner representative, contacted the Bureau of Street Services regarding proposed construction and the protected trees that were on the property. Mr. Garcia acquired the services of William McKinley Consulting Arborist, who wrote a report and indicates the property contains three protected trees comprised of three California sycamore trees. Per Mr. McKinley's assessment, the three numbered one through three western sycamore trees will be severely impacted and require removal. The subject protected trees measure approximately 10 to 30 inches in diameter by 40 to 70 feet in height and are in fair to poor condition. Two trees, number one and two of the protected trees, are growing directly adjacent to the proposed new driveway and are diagnosed as being diseased with oak root fungus. The two protected trees were left to remain. The trees would fail sometime in the future. Tree number three is located in the footprint of the uh, proposed uh, residence and is located in the backyard. A Bureau Arborist inspected the location on June 7, 2017 and agrees with the uh, protected tree uh, assessment that the trees have oak root fungus and are growing within the proposed footprint under the construction. Debbie Diner Harris, district director, who's here today, 11th council district, was contacted in form of the tree removal request on June 7, 2017. The applicant shall plant 12 24-inch box size California sycamore platinus racemosa trees to replace the three removed trees. The trees will be uh, guaranteed uh, survival by three years bonding if, if approved uh, here today. And that's it pretty much. Uh, you got two trees that have oak root fungus. Uh, they're showing signs of incipient decay, which is the very beginning stages of the oak root fungus. And once it's in the tree roots, it, it cannot be uh, uh, gotten rid of. So if you look at the photos, you'll see the trees, they're located up in a grassy area where there's a lot of plants all around them. So basically the trees were irrigated with irrigation for many, many years. And we all know that protected trees here in the state of California are drought tolerant. So therefore creating the environment for the oak root fungus to thrive. So all three trees are on the property. None are in the public right of way, correct? That's correct. Um, and you, have you, you've reviewed the, um, the design of 
the, the upgrade uh, um, to the property and there's no way that the trees could be saved? The tree in the backyard is right inside the uh, proposed residence and the uh, two trees in the front are uh, in the proposed driveway. Uh, but they also have oak root fungus. So uh, I don't think the city wants to be liable for allowing trees to remain that could eventually fail because they're already diseased. So the two trees in the front are, are diseased. The one in the back is still healthy, however? One in the back is healthy at this time. Okay, um, let's go ahead and hear from some of our speakers. Um, I will first call up um, Ms. Lisa Reed. Good morning. Um, my name is Lisa Reed. I have photos that I want to um, present to you. Um, the three other speakers here are going to give you more specific um, details. I'm here to tell you that I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up very close to where I'm living now. The reason I chose to live where I'm living is because of the beautiful trees, the nature, um, the tranquility, the harmony of um, our street. And to destroy three perfectly healthy, as far as I can see, trees will destroy the neighborhood. Um, if, if you can see by the photos, um, they're, as far as I can see, very healthy trees. Um, the, the house has already been demolished. Um, it's gone. Um, the, the way that, as you can see from the photos, all the dirt and all the rocks now are on top of one of the sycamores. Um, so there hasn't been any watering, hasn't been anyone taking care of these trees. Um, and I'm, I feel that you live in a canyon because of the trees and not destroy the nature and the trees. It's, it's, it's a hill that you drive up and that's the significant of, of the street is these beautiful trees all around. So that is what I have to say. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, Lainey Price. here today. Um, I am Lainey Price. I live across the street from the property. Um, I've lived in the neighborhood for the last 20 years. Um, I chose the neighborhood again because of the charm and the natural elements and especially the old beautiful trees. Removing these trees would dramatically change the visual landscape for not only me but for the surrounding neighbors. They, uh, I have shared the same gardener with the owner of the property prior to this new um, owner coming in. And it's not an owner, it's a builder. They're gonna demolish it. There's no, there's no regard for anything, for the integrity of the neighborhood. Um, uh, they wanna come in and build a big big house, tear everything down and go and do it on their next project. Respectfully, we're, we're okay with construction. That's what everybody is doing these days. But um, we are in the canyon for a reason. We chose that. Um, I have shared the same gardener. Um, with uh, the property. I have the same trees. I have sycamore trees just like that. Uh, mine are probably even older. Uh, mine are taller and um, they're perfectly healthy. At one time, many years ago, when we had a lot of rain, oat root fungus was there. I had an arborist come out. I've just learned about this because um, today, this morning, I was never told that anybody was going to be coming in and taking down the trees. I've got no notifications. I live directly across the street. I look straight at the sycamore trees. They're as healthy as mine are. Um, and we share the same gardener who does the same maintenance. 
um, does the same yearly maintenance as well as weekly maintenance. So I, I beg to differ with that. I, if we had known this earlier, with all due respect, I would have had my own arborist come out, and I'm sure the trees would have been perfectly healthy. Um, and especially when I just learned here as well that they want to have the dry, impeding the driveway. Well, if you look at the pictures that we've um, passed around here, um, those trees are right Two at minutes. the corner. So we're talking about a corner property here. So the trees are at the corner. They're not going to enter in from the corner um, with the plans on this property. I highly doubt they're going to enter in from where an existing driveway was. I was told that when I called the developer uh, when I first got it. They're going to keep the, the garage exactly where the garage is now. So I'm not sure what they're speaking about when they're talking about the driveway coming in there. Um, but tearing down the trees just changes the whole visual landscape of it. Um, uh, they don't, the developers don't particularly care about this, as I'm sure you know. Um, it's going to also send a negative uh, precedent for future developers within our neighborhood and our canyon. We have some um, uh, older homes in the neighborhood, big older homes with nice sized lots that developers like to come in. So by having a, um, a developer come in and pay the minimal fine or fee or whatever for taking down the trees and then coming in and barreling through, you're setting the precedent for ruining the whole canyon because there's a lot of development that goes on there. Also, if you look at one of the pictures on there, you can, from one of the angles, you can see the big, large um, sycamore and or oak trees from properties on the other part of Walther Way that have remained. And if anybody were ever to drive down Walther Way, they can see that there has been some newer construction there. And they kept the older trees there. So it is something that we urge you to take into consideration by not just letting them come in and, and, um, and you know, pay a fee to get it done. So. Um, watering the trees um, while they're tearing things down. It's all a complete trash pit over there, so nobody's taking care of it, of these beautiful trees. So you, I just urge you to please um, take that into consideration and set the precedent for the rest of the neighborhood. Um, it's a big issue in, on the west side of town, tearing down these trees. I know because I live there. Um, you're setting a precedent for not only what's happening across the street with seemingly perfectly healthy trees like I have on Thank you, ma'am. Property, but to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Lisa Elson. We do have a two-minute time limit on public speakers. I try not to be uh, too um, uh, hardcore on that. If people are still, you know, still have things that they want to say that aren't repetitive of things that have already been mentioned, they can go a little bit longer. Um, we, don't, we don't like to cut people off, but that's generally our guidance. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, and thanks for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, I live next door to the property that's um, being discussed. I live at 655 North Bond Hill Road. And the trees that are being discussed, one of them, the one that's healthy, that's in the back of the property, is a huge landmark tree in our neighborhood. You can see it from Bond Hill. You can see it from Walther Way. It is an incredible tree that I was very surprised that they were talking about taking down. Um, in talking to um, some people in the neighborhood, I think there is an alternate plan to um, to create the house and keep the trees because they knew that the trees were protected. So I don't believe that the developer would have an incredible hardship to go with their plan B. They have a plan A and a plan B. So we would ask that they consider doing plan B to keep and preserve the trees. Um, we also were given no notification in our neighborhood that this hearing was taking place, and we were all concerned about the trees being removed, so we were asking around with Bonin's office, and we found out kind of um, through some backward channels, but I, I feel like the procedures were not followed to properly post and let the neighbors know that the trees were being considered to be taken down. Um, with the amount of rain that we've had, also there are sometimes there are very simple treatments that can be done to preserve a tree if they need to have a treatment, maybe the treatment could just be done so that the trees could be preserved, and I would ask that that be considered to be done. Um, we, we started a petition yesterday and have over 100 signatures from people in our neighborhood that are concerned about these trees. So um, I would just ask that since we weren't really given notification and this arborist report came out of nowhere to us, that we be given an opportunity to at least have an arborist um, of our own look at the trees to determine if they are indeed sick and need to be taken down and that you would consider um, protecting these sycamore trees that are protected under law. And um, 
thank you for your consideration. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Ms. Helen Ann Hirsch. Hello, uh, my name is Helen Ann Hirsch. I live two houses down from the area in question, and I just want to thank you guys for the opportunity to speak, and I want to thank Councilman Bonin's office uh, for coming out today and support the community. I just want to reiterate a few points. You know, the natural beauty of the trees and everything I think is, is, is pretty obvious. Um, there really was a lack of notice in this circumstance. I mean, we, I can't believe all, a couple of us were able to come down today and that within 24 hours we got 100 people in this petition, but I'm not quite sure what the rules are for notification, but there weren't any, um, you know, maybe it was some obscure paper or the like, but I'd be curious to know what they were and whether or not the developer um, abided by them. I mean, it really strikes me that this is kind of the purpose of this ordinance. I mean, right now it's really a neighborhood in transition. You can't stop progress. A lot of these ranch homes are 50, 60 years old. People are entitled to buy them and do what they will with the property. But really the purpose of these ordinances, I think, is to maintain the integrity of the neighborhood and the environment. Um, and I really think that this is kind of crystallized in this example. Um, with respect to whether or not the trees are diseased, again, had we had any notification, I can assure you we could have had an arborist out as well um, to confer with us on that. The two trees in the front, um, the developer, they're in the front of the house. I mean, you know, it's not impacting the, the, the print of the house. And in the tree in the back, it's a stunning landmark. Again, there's already a um, plan in place, I think, to build a courtyard around it in the event that um, you guys don't allow them to destroy it. So again, thank you for your consideration. I, we are very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Um, before I go to our next couple speakers, I want to have Mr. Tyson come up. I have a couple questions. Um, Tim, um, can you talk about the notification for this hearing? The notification for this is sent to the council office, and this is the same practice that we've had since uh, prior to Old Ranch Road. There hasn't been any other notification that takes place other than that. Okay, so we notify the council office. There's no mailing to That is correct. There's residents. no mailings to the uh, people in the vicinity or anything like that for these protected tree reports. Okay, normally we would, um, normally we would, if it's, usually we're, we're looking at these trees that are in the public right-of-way and we put some sort of a notification on the tree itself. Trees in but. the public right away are posted for 30 days if it's three or more trees. Okay. That's correct. Um, okay, and I have one more question. Um, uh, you know, y your, your team has gone out and inspected the trees and has detected the presence of a disease. Um, is that disease visible? It, uh, you have to expose the uh, base of the tree and look for the mycelium webs of fungus. But so. if it's there, that means it's in the roots. And these trees, as was stated by one of the uh, uh, commenters, uh, that, uh, you know, 60, 70 years, yeah, the trees are probably 60, 70, maybe 80 years old. Uh, and the one in the back, if uh, there's other plans that someone has come up with other than what we've been given, I would certainly like to see them, but these are the plans we were given to process this and what was being built. And the one tree in the backyard is in the direct... Uh, proposed construction and development. And as I stated, if trees have uh, armillaria malia, then um, it's any number of time how long they may last. The uh, Lang Oak tree, uh, I don't know if anyone here is aware of that one, but that was the oldest tree in all of Southern California, and it was 1,200 years old. And it had armillaria malia, but it eventually failed and succumbed to the disease, as does all trees. Also, sycamores are uh, very prevalent to uh, the shot hole borer right now. So if the trees are stressed out with one thing, they can also be in invaded by something else. And, and our, our arborist findings are not, you know, we're not out there to try to make an argument for one side or another. We're out there to look at the tree and find out whether it's healthy, not healthy, what state it's actually in as part of the report. So. Our, I tend to think that our folks are actually advocates for, for saving trees. I've seen a that. Absolutely. We're fact finders. We uh -huh. go out and we present just the facts, and, and we have to deal with the facts of what we're given 
and how what's being built will impact these trees. Obviously, uh, they're going to replant 12 new Platinus Rasmosa trees around the property. Uh, there's one tree out in the front corner of the property. I couldn't tell real well in the photos what it is, but it's not a protected species. They have one other tree there. Okay. Um, Tim, I'm going to go ahead and call uh, our next additional two speakers, and then we'll bring you back up for questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call the uh, owner's representative, um, Mary McGlynn and Ray Nosrati. You are here representing Dr. Separzadeh. My name is Mary McGlynn. Good morning, everyone. Actually, Dr. Saparzadeh is a friend of mine who helped me with um, the situation with the trees. I am the property owner. You are? Okay. Yes. And I would just like to say that I appreciate everyone um, speaking today and their concern over the tree, as we are too. We um, love the trees, and it is a beautiful place to live. However, the trees are dangerous. We are willing at our expense to have the trees removed and to plant new trees that are healthy and to plant even bigger trees so that there is the same effect. It's a safety issue for me and my family. And I hope that you can understand that as we had a private arborist come in and do an assessment and the city also came in. The tree in the back, however, is not diseased per those it findings. Is. Yes, it is. Okay, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, if you looked at additional, uh, there was a reference to um, an additional design uh, that would have, have kept at least the tree in the back. Uh, good morning, Ray Nosrati. Um, we have looked at that. We were actually brought in um, with the architect team to go ahead and look at different designs. Uh, the way the lot is sloped, it's not all usable, and there's setbacks involved. Where the tree is located, it is almost humanly impossible to go ahead and design any different to be able to go ahead and get the usable of the actual house, to be able to design it that way. Um, the one in the front also, uh, because of the setback issues again, the way the garage and the, the two uh, car, the driveway was put, um, that was the best location that it would actually go ahead and work uh, because of the elevations and the slope that the lot has. Um, the lot is not all usable. Um, so, you know, it's very limited what we can do. There was also a, a new code uh, that had passed in March, uh, again, with setback issues and the score footage that you're allowed to build. Um, so, going over it over and over again, um, this is the best way that it was going to go out and work. The arborist that was brought in was a really well-known arborist uh, by the city. He's got a great relation with the city for many, many years. Um, and uh, the arborist that actually came out also from the city came out, went ahead and reviewed everything. Um, again, so we, in the cost that we went ahead and put from the McKinley family, um, we went ahead and put bigger trees in there already anyways to have privacy here and there. Um, so if it's going to help to be able to get something similar to those, I'm sure, you know, of course. they're open to it, you know, whatever we can do to make it work. So you're open to plant, right now the plan calls for you to, uh, to plant 12 24-inch uh, sycamores. Yes. Um, that, that is a, the three-to-one replacement that our policy calls for for protected tree removal, but you're open to maybe doing more than that, is that what I'm hearing? So if the department wants them to be bigger, I'm sure, you know, they've actually were okay with that also, to go ahead and put bigger trees or more trees, you know, whatever works with that, um, that can be done. And the thing is the house, uh, just so you know, the house was demolished already. Um, and I'll tell you from my understanding, when we met out there with the gentleman from the city, he said within approximately 90 days they'll be able to go ahead and get it done. So that's when we told them, hey, we can just go ahead and start demolishing it for them now. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's... I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I apologize. I apologize. Um, you know, so in third, she's saying she's okay with bigger trees. Uh, how? What was the size that the department was re um, recommending? In the reporter, 24-inch box okay. trees. So we can talk. Maybe yeah, 36. 40, you know. Th yeah, whatever. Okay. Um, we'll go. Ahead, we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. I wanted to go ahead and call up um, Debbie Diner Harris from Council District 11. Thank you, sir and ma'am. 
morning. I'm Debbie Diner Harris, District Director with Councilmember Bonn, and thank you, uh, Vice President and Commissioners and staff. Um, this is something that regularly happens in my experience, and I'm assuming in yours, that someone comes before you with an application to remove trees after they've got their permits, their design is done. It's almost like a fait accompli. Oh, everything's done. I can't afford to spend more money to redesign my house. You have to let me remove my trees. This happens a lot, and I've spoken with previous commissioners about this, trying to find a way to resol resolve this with the building department and the planning department. And, and I, I don't, no one's really come up with a solution how to address this, but it happens time and time again. Maybe mostly in our district, where we tend to have more open space and some of these older trees. I don't know what happens in other districts, but it's not uncommon. Um, so while I'm sympathetic in a way to the, the property owner, I'm also not because the people buy in this neighborhood because of these beautiful trees. And unfortunately, planting 24 inch, 12 24 inch box trees, and now they're offering bigger trees or more trees. Where are these trees gonna go? They're not gonna be able to fit them on this property. So where are they talking about replacing these trees? The trees that we're talking about removing are decades old and they have a significant impact on the aesthetics and the smell of that neighborhood and the way it looks and everything that these community members come into that neighborhood for. So simply removing these trees is not necessarily something that we're really supportive of. In fact, it's the lot may be challenging, but given where at least the trees in the front yard are, I, I don't know about the backyard because those are not as obvious to me, but the ones in the front yard are near the corner, you can do a lot with that and redesign the driveway around them. In terms of their safety, we've got millions of trees in the city that we don't have arborists looking at. We don't know when trees are gonna fall. Even these trees, which we hear are somewhat diseased, they could be there for 20, 30 more years, we don't know. And sycamore trees, um, if, if these are susceptible to the shot borer or whatever that's called, the, tw the new 12 trees or however many more trees are gonna plant are also gonna be susceptible. So living in fear of that kind of cripples us. So uh, our office would hope that at a minimum, we can take some extra time to give to the neighbors so that they can hire an arborist and to look at them themselves and see what condition these trees really are in and also perhaps give the property owner another opportunity to go back and maybe do some redesigning to save to maybe not all of them but maybe the ones in the front whatever we can do to be flexible um, I think at a minimum giving them more time to do that uh, at a maximum saying no would be also wonderful so thank you very much for your time thank you Debbie um, Tim do you want to come back up uh, Commissioner Davis yeah I wanted to kind of echo some of the issues that had just been raised um, <clears throat> with first the constituent and then just most recently with the council district director and that is <clears throat> the possibility of looking at options that might be available in terms of the trees I know it was mentioned that a courtyard was something that maybe the developer the architect could should maybe possibly could look at in terms of those trees around that area. Uh, and so um, I would think that uh, if they can look at that and explore it, that that might be something that might be considered in terms of looking at the trees. The other thing is um, how long the trees will last. I guess it's like trying to decide how long we're gonna live. Uh, in some circumstances, we may or may not know. Um, in terms of the life of the tree. Uh, our arborists, nobody is questioning them, uh, but what I'm hearing the constituents say is that they like to have the opportunity to bring in their, op their arborists as well. Is that something that Tim has done often, that the constituents bring their own op uh, arborists in to give a second opinion? Is that something that has done, been done before? Uh, it's happened before, and it could happen again. Um, I'm not opposed to that happening at all, okay. but I'm going to read. I'm going to read something here that comes right out of the uh, arborist report. Okay. And remember, uh, we uh, make sure it's a tree expert that does these reports. It's sure. not just a certified arborist. It's called a registered consulting arborist. And Mr. McKinley is an arborist, and uh, Mr. Godente who also went out and he reevaluated everything to stamp his report as, as just and sound, is a tree expert. 
So here you've got a certified arborist and then a tree expert who also went out and verified the report. Uh, the protected tree species found at 694 Walter Way, Brentwood, California, Sycamores. The tree species is protected by the city of Los Angeles. The proposed widening of the existing driveway and the proposed room addition near the southwest side of the existing house will require the removal of the three California sycamore trees. Tree number one and tree number two are infected with oak root fungus and are in danger of falling over. Okay, I'm not Hold on now. Can I finish the one sure. last tree, please? Sure. Tree number three exhibits early signs of root decay and the tree roots are beginning to damage the house foundation. So tree number three has no signs of oak root fungus. It just have early signs of some possible root decay. That would be the one tree that could be retained, not preserved, as per preservation means nothing within the drip line of the tree or anything is going to happen. The tree is preserved in its original state. So that would be a retention. And then here's the plans that we were given. Tree number three is right inside the footprint of the home. And the two trees out here that, I have, that have the oak root fungus are near the driveway. Now, just another thing I want to point out is I could have received a report for the two trees that said that they were diseased. And I could have issued a permit to remove those two trees without ever coming to board. Sure. Well, I'm not and questioning so any... we wanted to make sure that the board heard this, because there are three trees. Okay. And um, if the client is willing to plant larger trees, that's fine as well. On here also is where the planting plan is to plant the trees at the edges of the property. Okay, I want to reclaim my time. Okay, I'm sorry. Even though we're not in Congress. All right. Um, and in reclaiming my time, I'm not questioning any certification of anyone. Um, in many ways, I look at these arborists as like physicians, and I look at what you've clearly defined as disease. And in medical terms, oftentimes, even though everybody and every physician is certified, they look and approach the treatment to diseases in different ways. You've already answered my question that you're not opposed to constituents coming in with their own arborist. Not at all. So if that be the case, that was my question to you. And so if they want to come in with their own arborist, as in physicians, everybody looks at a disease and the treatment of it in different ways. Um, I would support their being able to do that if you're not opposed to it, which you've stated that you're not. And that's what I was trying to figure out, if you were just adamantly opposed to another certified arborist looking at the circumstance. Not because this is what I'm hearing from those who've come before us, is that they would like to have this other certified person to come in and to look at it. And so that was my only point. No, that's, a, that's not a problem at all. Uh, as far as looking at the ter trees, if they have the mycelium root fans or uh, fans of uh, fungus in them in the, in the base of the tree, that's fine. Uh, but, uh, they're not going to be writing a report like this that concerns the development of the property as well. So uh, my take is uh, in order to save the three trees, they're going to have to redesign the uh, development if they want to save them. And then you're saving trees that have a Could disease. Could there possibly be another opinion that we've not discussed as it, as it relates to the approach to these trees? Not that we know of. Well, for me, uh, is uh, you're, if you're trying to retain trees that are diseased, the inevitable will happen, and you're better off to remove the trees and get in new trees that are going to be healthier, safer for everyone around them, and actually provide back what the trees provide. Here's what I'm just simply saying. In as much as you support this effort, I think that they want to bring in, according to the district director and the constituent, another arborist. I can't tell you the cases of disease with people where yet another certified physician has seen something that the other two didn't see That's in true. a second and third opinion. And that was the question I asked you. So obviously, if everybody could see this third opinion, they would be the ones doing the assessment. 
So what I'm saying to you is we need that other person whom they've suggested that might be able to see something that we can't see. It happens all the time. Yep. And it's not a question of certification and qualification because every physician is certified and qualified when they are licensed, but every physician doesn't see the same thing. And I'm looking at this problem in the same way. That's all I'm simply saying. We want to give them the opportunity that they're claiming is important here. And then I'll just conclude to say we had an earthquake uh, last week and the trees are still standing. <laughs> now, why is that? I'm not an arborist. Didn't but shake I'm just hard saying, enough. I'm, I'm, I'm substantiating the reason why the third opinion, if you knew and could analyze what the third opinion is, then you would do it. What I'm just simply saying is let's give them the opportunity to do what they say is important. Absolutely. Commissioner Sinto. Thank you. Um, you know, in relation to Commissioner Davis' points and, and uh, sort of focusing on um, uh, Ms. Diners, um, Harris's um, point of the process of uh, developers working with their local counterparts, other stakeholders, I think is important because we have experienced this and we want to avoid um, as much as possible situations where our, the decision is taken out of our hands and we're forced by some process. I think if we could dial that back and ask the developers to sit down in earnest and look at redesign opportunities with the, with the local stakeholders, I think that that uh, represents what we're trying to do in, term, in terms of uh, maintaining local integrity. So I would support that. The process of the, of the third party uh, arborists will come in and we'll get an, another, uh, but I'm concerned with that process of um, of developers working with their local counterparts to create a, a more sustainable neighborhood. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Commissioner Sinto. Commissioner Rivas. You know, Tim, I trust your judgment that um, and your expertise and along with um, the arborist reports that the two, there's two trees that are diseased on this property. And um, like you mentioned, you could have gone ahead and issued that permit, but you chose to um, have it be part of this hearing which I really appreciate because um, you know how important trees are to that community. Um, and, uh, but you mentioned that the third tree in the back is healthy. Um, and um, so I would like to see if there's a way to save that tree. Um, if there's a plan, I think, um, as one of the speakers mentioned, in some way we're allowing developers to assume that we're going to approve these tree removals um, before a hearing takes place or before they go through the process. Um, so if there's any way to work on that, that's what I would support. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, basically, uh, it's called reasonable development. And um, when it's part of the home itself, that's reasonable. Tennis courts, pools, things that are secondary in nature that you don't need to survive, those are unreasonable things. But I'd be more than happy to work with the developer if he wants to redesign his house to uh, save that one tree. Um, Tim, I appreciate uh, all your work on this item. I think what we're moving towards is a, is a continuation of the item um, to give everyone more time. For me, I, and I've heard from my fellow commissioners that there's a desire to give the community time to have uh, you know, an, a third-party arborist look into the health of the trees. Um, you know, for me, it's also about notification, and I, I actually didn't realize that our process for these trees only involved the council office. I actually think that we should think about whether there's some sort of, you know, 500-foot radius letter that goes out from the city in these cases. I, it, to me, it seems... Um, this has been a big topic of discussion yeah. since Old Ranch Road. Okay, so that's that's on my list. Um, for me, um, I'm I'm I guess I'm less optimistic uh, than um, my colleagues about the possibility of you know it's not a big lot, the possibility of redesigning, and and, I, and I'm sympathetic to the property owner. They didn't do anything wrong here, and and they certainly sound like they're not you know, opposed to having trees on site and that they actually appreciate the sycamores and are offering to do more than our current replacement plan. We do have a policy. Our policy does not say that people cannot remove protected trees from private property. What it says is that if you do, then you will be planning back at least, at least three to 
four to one on that property, and that's the guidance that's been followed here. Um, I think that, for me, it's less about a redesign, although I would want that to be looked at. But at the very least, I think when we come back, let's see what more can be done in terms of replacements, particularly, you know, I believe our, our own internal arborists, um, when they say that they discover disease, you know, if the trees have to come out, um, then how do we put them back in the way that we can truly feel the best we can about it? And so what does that look like? Where are the replacement trees going to be put on the site? What size are they? Um, so let's continue this item. Um, how much time do you think is needed on this? It depends on how long the uh, constituents want to have to get their arborists. Okay. A month? That sounds good. Um, we'll continue for a month. So, commissioners, in case you um, do consider continuing for a month, this would put you at Monday, October 23rd, continuing the item. Ma'am, you, you had a, do you want to approach the mic? Yes, thank you. Um, as I can appreciate that we do want to preserve the trees and I have agreed to planting trees, um, you know, I'm paying money on this property. I am paying interest. Um, so if two experts have already said that the trees are diseased and it's not, the tree in the middle is not being removed for a tennis court or for a pool, um, you know, it's sort of like it's at my expense um, that, you know, this is being, I um, feel intrusive toward for me as a homeowner. I, I understand, ma'am, um, your concerns. However, these are tr um, California native protected trees, and so there is a, a process around them, mm -hmm. and that's this process. I, I think maybe, it, you know, whether. Uh, whoever's working on the build out of your property could have, if we could have initiated this earlier, um, even perhaps before the property was demolished, I don't know. But here we are in this situation where um, I don't have a plan before me to say where the tree's going to be put back. Um, and so I think we need more time on this. We'll get it done in a month. Uh, we'll put it on our agenda in a month. And I think that's, that's where we're at today. May I please, um, ma'am, we looked at this, and the location where these trees are sitting, there is absolutely no other way to design it so it's not sitting on their property. You know, before we went ahead and demolished it, we went ahead and met with the department just to verify it all, uh, not only with the arborists that came out, but this is the city arborist that actually came by and verified it also and put the report together, and this is exactly what they explained, that you're going to have to go ahead and plant three new trees, when, for every one you remove. This is the only reason why their house, we went ahead and demolished their house because of what we were told by, by the city also. There's no other way to design this house. Uh, I've been doing this for a while. We met with the architects, have gone through this, and it's, there, there's really no other way to go ahead and do this. And if I, they're I hear to you, go sir. ahead and put okay. bigger trees in there, um, you know, I mean, it's just, I, kind of doesn't, honestly, I don't think it's fair. I hear you. Um, however, the board has decided to continue the item for a month, so we will see you back again. So what here is it that you would like, on, on my part at least? On you, that? when you were here at the mic earlier, sir, you indicated that maybe more could be done. So let's hear what that is. Um, Let, what does that look what, like? So on the replacement plan, on so bigger, bigger maybe, trees. Bigger, okay, yeah, that's not a problem. I'm just saying to redesign the house, that's honestly impossible. It's already been already submitted. I think they spent over, how much have you guys spent for plans? It's almost $100,000 already that has been submitted to the city. The plans are, are towards the end. It was being back and forth from plan check. I, I hear you, sir. And I, like I said in my comments, I think there's a different level of expectation among the commissioners here on what can be done on that front. Okay. Um, I think we, we do have a problem with our city um, process. As, as Ms. Diner Harris stated, we really should be taking this up much earlier on. When you do have, you know, when you, you haven't, done all the work and spent all the money to get your plans uh, uh, signed off on. I hear that. Um, but where we are right now is we need a month. We'll be back here. Uh, please be in touch with Mr. Tyson on the tree replacement plan. Um, thank you very much for your time here today.
Um, I'd like to go on to agenda item number eight. Uh, this is a motion uh, in CD14. It's a bid rejection, Channel 35, Studio and Pico House seismic separation, recommending the board, number one, reject all bids for the above named project. Um, Ohaji Abdallah. Good morning, Ohaji. Good morning, commissioners, staff. As you see today, we have received bids uh, for the Channel 35 uh, studio relocation to the Merced Theater and the Sonic Hall. Unfortunately, the bids were uh, far, far exceed our current budget, and, uh, and, and, and therefore we have to reject bids as we look at redesign efforts to bring the design uh, back and under budget in this inflated construction market. Thank you. Um, did we go back out to bid on this one? We will be going back out. Okay, um, this, we didn't. We didn't extend the bid. No. no okay. We did not. No, okay. We did not. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, moved by Commissioner Sinto, uh, seconded by Commissioner Davis. Any objections? Thank you. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and approve, uh, adopt uh, this motion on agenda item number eight. Any objections to sending it forthwith? Hearing none, we'll send that forthwith. Agenda item number nine. It's a release of stop notice, Maine Electric Supply Company, Cummins and White LLP, attorneys for Maine Electric Supply Company, transmitting release of stop notice in the amount of $14,055.72 for furnishing work, labor, services, equipment, and material to Steiny and Company Incorporated, an apparent subcontractor in connection with the new Northeast Area Police Station project, the contractor for which is Bernard Brothers Incorporated. Um, is there a motion to receive agenda item number nine, moved by Commissioner Rivas, seconded by Commissioner Davis. That item will be received. Any objections to sending it forthwith? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and send agenda item, item number nine forthwith. Um, let's go back to agenda item number, th uh, number three. This is a toss. Uh, in CD14, task order solicitation number 27C, CH2M Hill Incorporated, 6th Street Viaduct Replacement Project, recommending the board, number one, authorize the city engineer to issue a revision of the task for solicitation, number 27C to CH2M, increasing the budget authority from $11,835,158,000 to $12,409,281,000 for additional $281 for additional program management services for the final design right of way and constru construction phases for the project. Um, Ms. Julia Moya from uh, the Bureau of Engineering. Thank you, Commissioner Penning. Julia Moy, Bureau of Engineering, 6th Street Viaduct Division. I'm here this morning requesting authorization for the city engineer to issue a revision to our task order with CH2M for program management and uh, for the construction phases and the right-of-way phases for the 6th Street Viaduct. Uh, CH2M has been supporting us throughout the project um, since they were initially brought on to support in 2012. Um, they've supported us on this unique project being delivered uh, through Caltrans with the CMGC or Construction Manager General Contractor Delivery Method unique to the city. Um, also a lot of heavy uh, coordination with Caltrans given the size, scope, um, and staging for the project. So they've been very crucial uh, to the delivery of the project thus far, their expertise and um, the services uh, they've provided beyond what was in originally anticipated, uh, including supporting additional estimates uh, for Caltrans. Caltrans not only at the 35, 65, and 90 percent level, uh, but asked that at the 100 percent level uh, we sit down and perform an independent estimate, and that was CH2M performing that function. Uh, that added to their scope of work. Um, in addition, there were a number of items unique to the bridge. Um, some major utility relocations and uh, unique use of triple uh, friction pendulum bearings um, to handle the seismic forces as well as allow for the very streamlined uh, design of the arch. So they worked with us and Caltrans to get uh, funding for those elements approved. 
Uh, they also did some additional environmental assessments for us for required by the United States Army Corps of Engineers to ensure we were in environmental compliance and in compliance with all appropriate procedures. And also given the scale and magnitude of the bridge, um, we've increased their services for public outreach through you know, our website, social media, um, in addition to the unique US 101 closures um, given the location and scale of the project and a, a opening grand ceremony to help celebrate uh, this unique project for this city. Uh, we're asking for $574,123 for these services. Uh, as noted in the board report, there was a 20% DBE, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, goal uh, for these services and CH2M, including uh, this new scope and past scope, has pledged 32.37% beyond uh, what was required. And finally, there is no impact to the general fund uh, for this increase in services. Uh, we have MICLA funding for the project that will be utilized uh, for these services. So I uh, recommend your approval. Thank you. Um, any questions, colleagues? Uh, moved by Commissioner Sinto. Madam Vice President, Second. just if I could, Fernando Campos, Executive Officer, we have an just amendment. for the record, yes, I just distributed a um, proposed amendment from the Bureau of Engineering for transmittal number four. It does not change the board report before you or the actions that you would take. Just for the record, uh, transmittal number four would be um, as revised. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah, unfortunately, an outdated copy. Thank you, um, Dr. Campos, uh, was included uh, with the board report. Uh, this is actually the, the proposal through negotiation. The, the price was reduced by uh, $15,000. So for the same scope of services, um, just a small uh, change to the transmittal there. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, a move to adopt the report as amended from Commissioner Sinto, seconded by Commissioner Davis. Any objections? Okay, hearing none, we will adopt the report as amended. Any objections to sending this forthwith? Hearing none, we will send that forthwith. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Um, agenda item number four, uh, CDs four, 11, and 13, subcontract outreach program report, Lee and Rowe Incorporated, design support services during construction for the pumping plant generators replacement phase three. Recommending the board, number one, receive and file this report. We have uh, Mary Thomas. Thank you. My name is Mary Thomas from Bureau of Engineering, Wastewater Conveyance Engineering Division. <clears throat> I'm here to report on the subcontract outreach program for Leandro, who was hired to provide pre-designed design and design support during construction for the collection system pumping plant generator replacement projects. The Bureau of Engineering recommend the board to receive and file this report. On April 8, 2015, the board authorized city engineer to award task order solicitation number 44 to Lee and Rowe with a budget authority of 500,000, including contingency. This contract expired on July 11, 2017. On July 12, 2017, the board approved a request to issue a sole source task order solicitation number 18 to Leandro to continue the design support during construction. In addition, the board requested BOE, <coughs> the Bureau of Engineering, to follow up with the board report to report the MBE, WBE, SBE, EBE, and DVBE subcontract outreach program participation information. Uh, the board report shows the subconsultant percentages based on the total invoiced amount up to July 11th and based on the remaining funds, respectively. Originally, Leandro pledged 12.5% MBE and 2.5% WBE. Under the new contract, Leandro is anticipated to achieve 25.6% MBE, 8.8% WBE, 5.9% for SBE and EBE, and 0% for DVBE, based on the remaining funds in the contract. Both tables in the report should be corrected to show the gender and ethnicity of the subconsultants, namely IEM as female Caucasian, CNJ, technical solution and services as, as male Hispanic American, Bayas and Patel as male sub, subcontinent Asian American, and Abri as male subcontinent Asian American. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Any questions? 
Commissioner Sinto. Thank you. Uh, Mary, just so that if you add the table two, which is anticipated BIP numbers, they, um, they would augment what has been done to date. They uh, won't replace that. So the 9.26 and the 1.02, maybe we be numbers will be slightly augmented due to the increases in table two. Is that correct? Uh, so I'm just trying to read the tables. Okay. Table one shows to as date. of July 12th, right. how much was spent right. based on the original contract. Right. So the remaining dollar amount in the contract is $76,604. So and the percentages are shown based on that amount. Okay, so they will augment. So the numbers, if they achieve those anticipated, yes. the numbers of 9.26 and 1.02 will, will go up. Yes, That's, okay. definitely, yes. Okay, but Thank the goal you. amounts were 12.5. Uh, and 2.5. So they're not there yet. They're not there yet. Okay, yes. all right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, motion by Commissioner Sinto. I'll second. Uh, seconded by Commissioner Davis and myself. Um, the, uh, any objections to adopting agenda item number four? Hearing none, we'll adopt agenda item number four. Any objections to sending this forthwith? Hearing none, it will be sent forthwith. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Agenda item number five. This is CD14, Revised Task Order Solicitation Number 14.1, Ketra IBI Group for Architectural Design and Environmental Documentation Services for the demolition of the Parker Center facility in preparation for the new Los Angeles Street Civic Administration Building Project. Authorizing the City Engineer to revise Task Order Number 14 to Task Order number 14.1 to increase the budget authority from $1 million to $2,300,000. Um, Reza. Bagazadze. Good afternoon, Can you please pronounce it for me, Reza? Pardon? Can you pronounce your last name for me? Bagazadze. Bagazadze, okay. Thank you, sir. Good to be here. Uh, as you may know, on March 24, uh, 2017, uh, the City Council approved the environmental impact report and demolition of Parker Center. And at that, uh, 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 soon after that, on April 19, 2017, the City Council authorized uh, $10 million uh, for demolition of Parker Center. So that, so that we can uh, begin the development uh, construction and development of a preferred option B3, which will develop a 27-story building with a 750,000 square foot and 1,170 parking spaces. The Task 14.1 uh, amendment to our original Task 14 uh, will allow the consultant to prepare demolition plan for a bridging document will prepare historic architectural building survey and uh, historic architectural land survey, plan and spec for harvesting of artwork, culturally significant elements, uh, complete plan and spec for modification of all utilities, uh, routed through Parker Center from City Hall South, City Hall East, to Metro Detention Center, as well as 9-1 building. And also maintain an expert in the preservation of historical and artistic components of the high-rise building. So uh, this uh, the total consultant fee will be about $877,000 with about $30,000 reimbursable and a about $390,000 uh, contingency, uh, which will amount to $1,300,000. The total maybe we be for the original task uh, came up to be about 11.06 percent for maybe and 2.04 percent for uh, WB. The total uh, maybe maybe we be for the revised task order will be about 11 percent and 3 percent. However, barefoot production will, uh, as soon as they are certified as a maybe, the total revised task. 14.1 will have a 2.03 maybe. If you have any question, I'm here to answer. Thank you, sir. Sure. Uh, questions? None? 
a, a motion by Commissioner Jacinto, seconded by Commissioner Davis. Any objections to adopting agenda item number five? Hearing none, we will adopt this item. Any objections to sending it forthwith? Okay, the item Thank will be so sent much. forthwith. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank it. you for your patience today. Thanks, Mahmoud. Um, Mr. Campos, Dr. Campos, have I cleared the desk? Yes, you have. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, meeting for uh, today, September 25th, 2017, is adjourned. Thanks, guys. Thank